My next guest has an unusual story. After building a successful career as a legal counsel and founding the firm Montgomery & Hanson, he observed hundreds of companies succeed or fail in the valley. He then made a bold proposition that advocated that startup companies should adopt the principles that the most innovative and successful companies had proven to be viable and adopt those right at the startup, right at the beginning of the company. John Montgomery published his ideas in a book titled Great from the Start. And it talks about how to avoid many of the pitfalls in building a great company. However, during the writing of the book near the end of that cycle, John observed the personal and financial damages caused by the financial meltdown of 2008. And that gave him a different perspective that came out of this book, which will be one of the topics we talk about tonight. John, welcome to the show. I've known you for a number of years. I'm delighted to have you on the program. Let's start by you explaining to our audience what led you to write the book. Well, Jim, it was an epiphany that I had while reading Jim Collins' Good to Great. I had the great privilege of working with Gordon Campbell in his Tech Farm Incubator in the early 90s. And Gordy had a hot hand. He had um, about 20 companies that he incubated in, in the Tech Farm portfolio in which he served as the executive chairman and co-founder. And um, in the midst of reading um, Good to Great, um, I, I realized that there was a, um, a pattern in how Gordy had created one enormously successful company after another. And my thought, the inspiration for, for Great from the Start was to reverse engineer Gordy's magic. And my, my thought was that if I could reverse engineer the methodology that a very intuitive co-founder had used in building successful startup after successful startup, we'd have a, a blueprint in how to design companies from the get-go that optimize their probability of success. How did that, does that, has that worked? You know, in many ways, I, I, I founded Montgomery & Hanson in 2003 as a, a laboratory to really test out the ideas the, uh, that are in the, in the book. And in 2003, I naively thought that I had really un unpacked Gordy's methodology. And the deeper I got into it, the more I realized there was something going on on a, on a neurological and, and science of consciousness basis mm -hmm. in how Gordy was constructing these businesses. Because what, what I observed was sort of a field phenomenon where Gordy, who had self-actualized by uh, making a, a good amount of money and by having founded two successful public companies that he you know, took public and ran and having invented the fabulous semiconductor industry, Gordy had a hell of a lot of self-confidence. And he would use his state of being to infect the founders in each startup with the confidence that they could climb Mount Everest. And the founders in company after company believed that, well, if Gordy thinks that we can climb Mount Everest, well, we can do it. And they did. And um, this led me into a fascinating uh, journey into the neuroscience and um, science of consciousness that was underlying Gordy's, the method in Gordy's madness. If a leader is fear-based, um, guess what? The field of consciousness within the business is going to be fear-based. The neuroscience shows that when we human beings work in environments where we're loved and trusted, we're twice, twice as productive, twice as happy, and our tenures are, are twice as long. We stay in the frontal cortex where our brains produce oxytocin, which is a bonding chemical, mm -hmm. and dopamine, which makes us feel good, and we access the higher brain faculties, creativity, collaboration, and cooperation. And the, the underlying thesis of my book is we finally are beginning to understand enough about the human being and the human psyche so that we can actually start designing our businesses so that they're optimized for the human beings that have to work in them. And we can cultivate leaders that understand the neuroscience and psychology and, and consciousness so that they can inspire optimal performance from the people on their teams. And ultimately, what, what, what I witnessed Gordy do was, was activate a collective flow state, much like you get on a successful athletic team mm -hmm. or a choir or a band. And he did this in company after company. 
<laughs> the people in those companies felt that it was accidental, but my thesis is if you understand the underlying science, you can actually replicate these conditions mm -hmm. which optimize the potential for successful business performance. So it took a pretty accomplished individual like Gordy to do this. He did it somewhat unconsciously. It was his part of his fabric of who he was. And he could tell somebody, you're capable of doing this. You're capable of crossing a river, climb, and they would believe it. And yes. that belief is what enabled them, if I can use the word, empowered them to take off. Is that a movement or a, a, a subject that you're starting to pursue more beyond the book? Yeah. I, I mean, my belief is that we're, we're going to look back at the 21st century, and it's going to be all about consciousness. Mm -hmm. And um, my sense is that um, benefit corporations, conscious capitalism, sustainability, impact investing, corporate social responsibility are all evidence of a massive shift in global consciousness from egocentricity to other centricity to a, a global or planetary centricity. Okay. We're one planet and the internet connects us all in ways that were unimaginable when I started my career. Yeah, it's a different world today, it's a different, world. It's a different planet. I read the book and, I, and I've talked to you a little bit and I think it really helped our audience to understand this evolution from the sovereign king granting the initial um, tenets of a corporation to an entity to go <laughs> and do whatever they wanted to uh, without any regard to the people living there or the environment. Maybe you could revisit that, that concept. I think it's a very good foundation to where sure. you are. Well, one of the biggest impediments to creating a sustainable global economic system is our basic corporate form. Mm -hmm. And what we all do is take the corporate form for granted. And virtually every uh, sovereign nation on the planet uses essentially a corporate form that, that originated in the age of exploration in Europe in the 1500s. Um, the corporation was generally used as an agent of empire and kings such as the King of England would charter the Hudson's Bay Company. Mm -hmm. It would give it a monopoly to exploit the entire Hudson's Bay watershed, which is about 15% of the land mass of North America. And the, the goal of that company was to conquer the, that foreign lands for the king and exploit them for the benefit of the company and also the royal treasury. And this was done at, at a time where uh, the prevailing Christian ethos was that if you weren't a Christian, you weren't human. And so the native peoples that these companies found were, were treated you know, less than royally. And um, we believe that we were supposed to go out and, and ex exploit the earth for our, our benefit. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the ethos of the corporation is it's, it's, a, it's an agent of empire. And the original construct, the, the king was the external conscience of the corporation. So if the Hudson's Bay Company misbehaved, the king could yank the charter, uh, give it to somebody else, put the managers of the Hudson's Bay Company in jail. Um, and what happened in our American Revolution is that we inherited about 50 corporations that, that had been chartered in England. The English corporate form slipped into the new nation, sort of unnoticed, and um, the, we got rid of the king, but the conscience function served by the king mm -hmm. devolved into our state legislatures. Mm -hmm. So until 1811, our legislatures served as the external conscience of corporations. And if you wanted to charter a company back in the early days of the Republic, it took an act of legislation. Mm -hmm. And um, New York changed all of that in 1811. The, one of the biggest innovations ever in the history of corporate law was the invention of free incorporation and limited liability. See. And with those inventions, any sociopath who can fog a mirror <laughs> can incorporate a corporation. Yeah. And it has happened. And it, and it has <laughs> happened. And, and so the social license mm -hmm that flowed from the sovereign to the corporation was disbanded. And um, that, those inventions spawned the age of industry, which brought untold wealth and prosperity to the planet. But um, the result is the corporation has no internal social or environmental conscience. Mm -hmm. So you've been a big advocate of the evolution of a new concept, the B Corporation, the Public Benefit Corporation. That is a, apparently a dual mandate or a dual priority or a dual, respons a dual responsibility. Maybe you can describe that a bit. Sure. So um, 
I, I was instrumental in helping benefit corporation legislation get passed in California in 2012. California was the sixth state to adopt benefit corporation legislation. And I'm going to make your audience an expert in this new corporate form. <laughs> it's incredibly simple. Uh, we tried to make the legislation as simple and user-friendly as possible. And the benefit corporation is identical to the existing general corporation. It's a for-profit entity with three key differences. There's a public purpose, which in California means the benefit corporation must optimize profits as usual, mm -hmm. but it also must do it in a way that, that provides a material positive impact on society and the environment from its operations taken as a whole. Mm -hmm. So baked into the architecture of the corporation is the requirement to sort of juggle three balls. You've got to take care of shareholders, mm -hmm. you've got to take care of people, and you've got to take care of the planet. People, profit, and planet. Mm -hmm. So um, the other element is accountability. So um, you have to measure your provision of a pos material positive benefit on society and the environment against a third party standard. And there's uh, transparency. You have to report the, how you're doing and providing a material positive impact on society and the environment to the public and to your shareholders at least annually. That's great. That's great. Where do you think this will go? I mean, it started recently. Well, Delaware just did it last year, California 2012. It might take a certain number of years. I think there's an enormous opportunity. Silicon Valley is the global megaphone for new ideas. Mm -hmm. The Benefit Corporation is a disruptive technology. It's game changing. And my belief is that there's an enormous opportunity for a public company like Cisco, like Agilent, like HP, like Yahoo, uh, Google, to become the first public benefit corporation. Big public. Big public. Yeah. You know, I would challenge Google or HP or any of these companies to become the first corporation to actually stand for doing good mm -hmm. and put their money wh where their mouth is by adopting a corporate form that actually requires them to act with a planetary conscience. Mm -hmm. And um, my belief is that you know, just as Google became the thought leader in corporate America by standing for do no evil, it or another company could be a global icon for standing for good. Yeah. We might get a startup, a big startup, making a big hit who becomes a public benefit before we're going to get shareholders to agree to, because there'll be a fear factor, I'm sure. There, and there'll be a regulatory factor. There'll be this and that. And it may take that someone like the next Google, you know, Next game changer, Google comes along and does it. Uh, it's hard to say. Well, the the second biggest impediment to a sustainable global economic system is is our lawyers, and we lawyers are risk averse. Yeah. And you know, the benefit corporation changes the fiduciary duty of, of directors, mm -hmm. and they 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 must determine in determining whether something is in the interest of a corporation, they have to consider the effect of that action on all the company's stakeholders, not mm -hmm. just shareholders. Right. John, this has been very informative. I've thoroughly enjoyed having you in here uh, on the television show, Game Changers Silicon Valley. I think I'm going to like to have you back. Um, we'll see how the response goes, but I think there's more to talk about, which is we have this foundation. Now where do we go and how do you do it? And I think this will be a good follow-up program. Fabulous. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. My pleasure. My pleasure. This is Jim Connor. I'd like to thank you for joining us for this week's version of Game Changers Silicon Valley. Each week we will address a new area, a new topic with innovators and game changers. We look forward to your interest and your participation in future shows. Thank you very much. Good night now.